mentioned the Security Council resolutions and the whole regime that is set up with Minurzu and all, we came to the conclusion with the legal office that those resolutions had very little bearing on the question that we were supposed to analyse. So that given, uh, didn't give out much uh, but, um, uh, uh, guidance, as it were. More guidance we received from General Assembly resolutions, in particular one from 1962, where again the principle of permanent sovereignty over natural resources was endorsed. And that was reaffirmed later. In particular, I'd like to refer to the International Covenants on uh, political and, and um, uh, sorry, on civil and political rights and on um, economic, social and cultural rights. Those were adopted in 1966 by the United Nations General Assembly. Now, the legal nature of the core principle of permanent sovereignty over natural resources as a corollary to the principle of territorial sovereignty or the right to self-determination is indisputably part of customary international law. That was one conclusion we drew. But the exact scope of these implications are not so clear. And that's where we, we had a problem. And if you give a legal opinion as legal counsel to the Security Council, you have to be very, very careful here. Because these are treacherous waters. And of course, your words will be used by one side or the other uh, as uh, they see fit to suit their purposes. And as a matter of fact, partly this was done also when the legal opinion uh, was uh, delivered. The case law of the International Court of Justice didn't give much guidance either, in particular since the cases that uh, pertain to the same area were never really adjudicated uh, by uh, the court. In one case, the court found that it didn't have jurisdiction, and the other case, the court uh, actually didn't have to rule because the parties came to an agreement and, and, and made a, 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 a deal that uh, meant that the court didn't have to, to, to rule. State practice we also looked at, and really we didn't find so much guidance here either. We looked in particular to um, phosphate, the phosphate deposits, and I'm sure we will hear about them in, in Western um, uh, Sahara. But that was statements that were made during the time when Spain was administering the territory. And Spain maintained that they uh, did not uh, claim any benefits from the proceeds that the, those um, uh, exploitations uh, generated. Whether that is true, I, I do not know. It's no possibility for us to go uh, so deep into this issue to, as to find out exactly how this was. Another state we looked at was Namibia. But here again, <clears throat> we didn't find much uh, guidance because of the fact that the presence of South Africa in Namibia was not accepted by the Security Council. And basically, they had ordered South Africa out of that country. And East Timor, we didn't find the, the, any relevance here when we looked at the practice uh, for the purpose of our uh, analysis. So, to respect the 10 minutes, what were our conclusions in the legal office? First of all, I repeat again the question. The legality of actions allegedly taken by the Moroccan authorities consisting in the offering and signing of contracts with foreign companies for the exploration of mineral resources of the Sahara. The first question analyzed was the an, an, is an analogy. Uh, so whether mineral resource activities in a non-self-governing territory by an administering power is illegal as such, or only if it is conducted in disregard of the interests of the people. And here we came to the conclusion that what we saw actually supported the latter conclusion. Namely, it is permitted as long as it is not disregarding the interests of the local population. So the principle here, the sacred trust, has to be maintained. Then we had seen also that the General Assembly had consistently condemned the exploration and plundering of natural resources and any economic activities which are detrimental to the interests of the people in these territories. So we saw then that it recognized, however, the value of economic activities which are undertaken in accordance with the wishes of the peoples of those territories. Now here again, of course, 
we know that there are different views here, in particular among the population in Western Sahara. We did not find any clear guidance in the adjudication of the International Criminal Court. So, and in the recent state practice, we find an opinion juris that where the resource exploitation activities are conducted in territories of this nature for the benefit of the peoples of these territories or on their behalf or in consultation with representatives, they are considered compatible with international law. In the present case, we came to the conclusion that the contracts that we had seen, and we had the privilege of having access to them in spite of the fact that they are privileged information, but the Moroccans gave us access to these uh, contracts. They concerned the exploration, but not the exploitation. So therefore we came to the conclusion that those contracts as such were not illegal. However, if they would continue, those who engage in the activities, in further exploration and exploitation in disregard of the interest of the local population, then they would be in violation of international law. I realize that this is a very, very sort of formal presentation, but I have to be careful here, and I'm not sort of prepared to go outside the boundaries of this legal opinion for the simple reason that when this is official, it is the word of the opinion where every word is sort of weighed in the golden scale that counts, and then much water has flown under the bridges since then. And I'm very interested to hear the other panelists develop their opinions, and then maybe we can discuss further, uh, which I think we should, uh, before we close the session. Thank you.